the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Most Holy Virgin Mary, tender mother of men, to fulfill the desires of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, I consecrate myself and my family to thy sorrowful and immaculate heart, O Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, and I recommend to thee all the people of our country and of all the world. Please accept my consecration, dearest Mother, and use me as thou wish to accomplish thy designs in the world. O sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary and Queen of the world, rule over me, together with the sacred heart of Jesus Christ, my King. Save me from the spreading flood of modern paganism. Kindle in my heart and home the love of purity, the practice of a virtuous life, an ardent zeal for souls, and a desire to pray your rosary more faithfully. I come with confidence to thee, O throne of grace and mother of mercy, mother of fair love. Inflame me with the same divine fire which has inflamed thine own sorrowful and immaculate heart. Make my heart and my home thy shrine, and through me make the heart of Jesus, together with thy rule, triumph in every heart and in every home. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So we've heard a lot of things throughout our time here today, and as we were planning this conference, I really did have a special uh, zeal in my heart to have it on the Feast of Christ the King, so I'm glad we got that done, and today is his feast. And one of the reasons is because the message of Fatima is, is really in its very essence, it's the gospel, okay? It's the same gospel that Jesus Christ, our Lord, preached. His mother is coming to preach it again. And that's a topic in of itself, which I would love to go into at another time. But because it's so intimately connected to the gospel, one of the things you'll see is that if you take our major feasts, like Corpus Christi or the Feast of Christ the King, you can sort of see Fatima through the lens of that great mystery of our Trinitarian God and other things sort of surface. I mean, you can actually do this with any part of the gospel. You could take you know, any reading, for example, any gospel reading on Sunday and look at it through the lens of Christ the King or look at it through this lens of, let's say, the mystery of Corpus Christi. Um, and I did that, in fact, in June. I was in New Jersey and it was on the feast of Corpus Christi that Thursday. And so we looked at Fatima from the lens of Corpus Christi. And so I wanted to do that with Christ the King. And so that's sort of where we're going to go. But at the same time, instead of getting down into maybe some of the details, as uh, you know, some of our speakers have very expertly, Chris Ferrara, Suzanne Pearson, they've given you some real good details so you have the, the weapons with which to discuss the message of Fatima with others, I'm going to try to give you more of a bird's eye view. Okay, so step back a little and see the whole picture. Because I do think that's very important. Uh, certainly the details are important. They are. But one can get a little lost in those details at times or get into too many arguments or discussions or even slip into error because you're not taking the detail, let's say, in the right context. So if you have the right context and the overall picture of Fatima, then I think it's a lot harder to fall into error and to really keep what needs to be centered and focused, centered and focused. So my hope is that through this talk, we will increase your understanding of the message and avoid errors, but most importantly, that you live the message more faithfully, especially that you recognize the urgency, urgency of the message, okay, urgency. I mean, if there's one word you leave with, leave with urgency. We have no more time to waste, and this is why we're really calling this Fatima, the moment is now. Um, we, we really do, and, and we need to fill ourselves with a spirit of urgency and everyone else with a spirit of urgency. Too many people are thinking, for example, uh, you hear this, well, Fatima's done. Uh, you even hear this from prelates, from hierarchs. No, no, it is not. Or, well, Fatima's only about the rosary. We've got to pray the rosary. There's some good apostolates out there pushing the rosary, and that is important, but that is not all about Fatima. There's more things. You're, you're not getting the bird's eye view if you think either of those two things. Then there are the others who maybe are on the other side and say, oh, it's too late. It's too late now, you know. And so they also disregard the Fatima message because according to them, it's too late. It's not too late. Never forget a certain quote that our Lord and Our Lady told Sister Lucia, it is never too late to have recourse to the sacred hearts and the immaculate heart. And, you know, again, in your faith, you know that. It's never too late to have put your trust and your faith and your love in Our Lord and Our Lady. So it's not too late, but we better move quickly. 
Uh, others will tell you things like, look, stay calm. It's not a big deal. Okay, we're in a crisis. But the church has always been through crisis. You know, we've gone through these things before. Um, I don't like that either. Because again, when I hear that message, it seems to be losing some of the urgency. Okay, so these errors are all limiting the effective power of the message of Fatima and reducing its urgency. Yes, the church has been through crises before. I know that. But we're in one right now, and we've got to work on it. And quite frankly, this is the worst one we've ever been in. You know, it'd be like if someone said, we've used this analogy before, but if somebody said, you know, ships have always sunk. So what are you worried about that? I'm like, well, I'm on a sinking ship. I'm going to be worried. It doesn't matter if ships have sunk all the time. We got to deal with the sinking ship right now. It doesn't, you know, I mean, that's sort of like the attitude of it, I sometimes think. Um, And again, yes, the church has been through this. Look, we've been through things, bad times, but never anything like this. Okay, why would I say that? Well, there's a lot of reasons why I say we've never been through something like this. I don't want to spend my time on this, and you probably know enough about this, but I'll just give you a brief catalog of some of the big problems we're facing. And if I say something that scandalizes you or you're unaware of, maybe you go study it a little bit. Um, We'll start off with a big elephant in the room that people don't like to talk about that a pope resigned, and now two men in Rome wear the white. Every Catholic should be really upset about this, okay? Because we cannot have two popes. The church cannot have two popes. It's not a possibility. It's a monster for a body to have two heads. The pope is to be the head. So we can't have two popes. We cannot have two men dressed in white in Rome that exercise pontifical-like powers, That should be tipping off every Catholic that the crisis is way beyond something else. We've had two popes before, but one's always been an anti-Christ, an anti-pope. And he hasn't lived, and he hasn't lived in Rome. He's been kicked out of Rome and he's been somewhere else, you know. So it's never been this way, where they sort of are cohabitating in the same Vatican. Uh, That's really bizarre. And the fact that Catholics aren't more upset about this, and we're not sort of clamoring every day that this has to be resolved, is is already very indicative of how grave the crisis is. But it's connected to the message of Fatima, because in the third vision, Lucia said that they saw a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that he was the Pope. Why would she use those words as if, and we saw him as if in a mirror? We see him as if in a mirror we have the impression that he's the Pope. Clearly, they're telling us they saw someone who was not the Pope but dressed in white. And he was giving the impression that he was the Holy Father. Not that he was. Straight from the third secret. Revealed by the Vatican in 2000. We should have all been ready for this if we were paying attention to the message of Fatima. Okay, so that's never been happening before. Then we had Amoris Laetitiae back in 2016, which is upending all Catholic moral teaching. Uh, That's a very problematic document. We see how the Vatican is pushing the New World Order. Father Altman talking about that, a one-world religion. The Abrahamic family house that they're building in Abu Dhabi, where they're trying to tell us that all religions are the same and we can all worship God in the same way. Uh, The Sino-Vatican agreement between uh, Francis and China, that's really bad. The Vatican silence on abortion. Uh, the red carpet being rolled out for those in the Vatican who have an anti-Catholic and anti-life agenda. Financial malfeasance galore in the Vatican banks and in many parishes and in many dioceses. Perverse sexual practices and covering them up by the hierarchy. I mean, this is scandal upon scandal that is wrong. Our morality is being destroyed within the church, certainly within society. Good priests are being torn down and shut down and canceled, as we've just heard. And the heterodox ones that don't promote the faith are being elevated into the bishops, the miter hats, and the cardinalists. Grave, grave crisis. And then from the Vatican, we get blasphemies against Our Lady. There's been quite a few blasphemies uttered against Our Lady from the current man who sits on that throne. Uh, There's great sacrilege against the Holy Eucharist, especially starting to say that people who are in public, grave sin, may receive Holy Communion. That's completely outrageous. Uh, The traditional Latin Mass, the Mass of our ages, is being attacked and trying to be destroyed. That comes straight from the pit of hell. It's the only place that comes from. But, But David, it's also coming from the Vatican. It's true. And from our chanceries. That's got to wake us up. Even for those who do not assist at the Latin Mass, they have to recognize this is the greatest treasure the church has. And its roots go all the way back to St. Peter. St. Peter! That means they go back to our Lord 
Who has the audacity to change that or to attack it or to try to destroy it and try to get rid of it? This is a grave, grave, grave problem. And then we've had idol worship in the Vatican. Violation of the first commandment. I was there in Rome when the synod of the Amazon was taking place and we saw the Pachamama idols and they were being worshipped in the Vatican gardens and in the Vatican Basilica. And what that is doing is that is opening a door and allowing the devil to get enthroned within our own church by the authorities. That's what idol worship is about. Okay, this is worse than the golden calf back in the Old Testament of Exodus. It is worse, far Far, far worse. And then, of course, it happened up in Canada again. More idol worship. And it's coming. So, so things are bad. And this is why I say we've never been through something like this before. What's coming? Worse things. I mean, they're going to be saying with this sin on synodality that's ongoing. They're going to try to probably eliminate celibacy for priests, making it optional. They're going to try to start letting women get ordained versus deaconesses and priestesses. That is all coming down the pike. It is coming very soon. Uh, they're going to try to change the catechism to say that contraception is morally licit. Uh, they're trying to change the catechism to say that you can receive communion if you're not a Catholic or if you're in a state of mortal sin. They're going to try to push the transgender ideology. And they're going to be telling you that we can now bless these unions and have a certain right for them in the church and that all are accepted uh, and holding on to their sin. You know, don't let go of your sin and you can still be accepted here and receive the precious body of our Lord. Doesn't work that way. Creating national churches, I mean, schisms. All of this is headed to us via this synod and synodality where they wish to basically change the church so that it is no longer what it's always been. Uh, so, so things are bad, and to say that the church has been through bad things before really lacks precision, and we're not acknowledging the gravity of the crisis. And if you really want to know the gravity of the crisis, it's simple. You, you just look at Our Lady, because God is always proportionate. Okay? So if the crisis is bigger and worse, He does greater things for us and makes greater graces available. And what we have in Fatima is the greatest miracle that has ever taken place not recorded in sacred scripture with the miracle of the sun. So as to verify the entire message of Fatima. What you have promised at Fatima is world peace and the salvation of many souls. God's never made that promise before. He's never said, do such and such, and I will give you world peace. And the world has never had world peace. So we've never had a miracle like this, and God's never offered graces like this. That means there is a proportionate evil at work also. Okay, so the message of Fatima itself should clue us into the fact that this is the worst crisis we've ever been in, which is why God is helping us so much. So don't let people tell you, look, we've been through that before, things of that sort. Well, we don't want to despair, of course, uh, but we do need that sense of urgency. And that's why we're going to turn to the message of Fatima. Uh, and that's why these great, pro these great miracles are promised by Our Lady. Now let's take a minute to look at Christ the King. This is certainly an age-old issue, the kingdom of Christ. It goes back to the Old Testament. If you recall, God basically says, I want to be your king. And the people say, no, not really. We want a human king. Why don't you give us Saul so we can be like the other nations? And there's a little bit of back and forth going on there, but in the end, God says, well, you're going to get what you asked for. Here goes. You're going to get the human king and all the problems that come with it. But even then, we see that there is the tension between saying, God wants to be our king, and us saying, no, no, we prefer a human king, one we understand, one that works according to worldly ways and not divine ways. And that problem traces itself throughout the history of the Old Testament and the monarchy there, but even into our times. You see it with Herod pursuing our Lord, when he's an infant, you see it with Pilate in his sermon. Father Lovell was talking about that, but Pilate, who is saying, what is truth and questioning Christ's kingship and the whole issue of the state and the church and the Sanhedrin that is the religious leaders and they're getting corrupted because they're co-opted and they're working with the Roman government, the pagan Roman government to take down and destroy and kill Christ the king. You see it throughout the imperial persecutions of the church. And even after that, once Constantine brings in the church, there is a continual tension between the emperor, for example, in Byzantium, in Constantinople, trying to control the papacy and trying to control the church and use it to its ends. You see it certainly in the history of the church with kings like Philip the Fair of France, 
who possibly had one pope poisoned and had another pope attacked in Anagni. This is in the 1300s and eventually got the popes to go live in France so he could put them under his thumb. Again, you see the kings trying to assert their authority over Christ the king. You see it in Henry VIII. I'm going to have my own church. I'm going to set up things here. So, so it's been there with us with the, with the emperors, Frederick Barbarossa setting up his own anti-pope, uh, even really with Joseph II of Austria in the 1700s, 1800s, um, French Revolution attacking the altar and throne. Napoleon trying to set himself up as the emperor of all and taking the pope away from Rome and saying there'll never be another pope again. That you had to, when he died, the pope died that Napoleon in prison. They actually meet secretly in Venice and they elected the pope before Napoleon could do anything about it. Napoleon was very frustrated that another pope rose up. Thought I got rid of Paul VI. Here comes Paul VII. What's going on? Or Pius, I'm sorry, Pius VI, Pius VII. So this has been with us for a long time. Um, I do encourage you to read Quas Primas. That's the encyclical from 1925 written by Pope Pius XI in which the feast of today was established. And I'm just going to read you a couple of quick quotes from there to sort of guide us here on what the popes are teaching with regard to Christ the King. Paragraph number one, he says, The manifold evils of the world are due to the fact that the majority of men have thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. These now have no place, either in private affairs or in politics. As long as individuals and states refuse to submit to the rule of our Savior, there will be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. A little later on in paragraph 18, he's actually quoting Pope Leo's encyclical, Anum Sacram, from 1899. So you have two popes teaching this exact same thing. It says, his empire, Christ's, includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons, who, though of right belonging to the church, have been led astray by error, or have been cut off from her schism, or who have been cut off from her by schism. It's not just those, but also all those who are outside the Christian faith, so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. So not just Catholics, not just those whose ancestors were Catholics, not just those in schism, all those are under Christ's kingship, and everyone is under Christ's kingship, the whole world. This is Christ's universal and social kingship. Pius XI adds, nor is there any difference in this matter between the individual and the family or the state. For all men, whether collectively or individually, are under the dominion of Christ. In him is the salvation of the individual. In him is the salvation of society. Perfect sense to a Catholic. He's our Savior. And he's the only Savior there is, of course. Last quote from paragraph 19. When once men recognize both in private and public life, that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessing of real liberty, of well-ordered discipline, of peace, and of harmony. Okay, this is the Pope's teaching, and it's just really Catholic teaching. It's Catholic Church's teaching. It's St. Peter's teaching. It's Jesus Christ's teaching. And as I read this, you know, one of the things that really popped out at me is I said, this is interesting because the Pope keeps talking about how we want peace and we're not going to have peace without Christ the King. And so that was immediately for me the link to the message of Fatima because what is Our Lady promising? She's promising peace. But obviously Our Lady's not going to do this sort of apart from the papal teaching that is reality and Catholic teaching. So in this message that Our Lady is bringing us of peace in the world, but we also know we have to have Christ there. That means the lady's message at Fatima is intimately linked with Christ's kingship. If Fatima is really going to be realized, then Christ's kingship must also be realized. Because you can't have peace without Christ being acknowledged as king in public and private affairs. Right? But Our Lady's promising peace. So all that is going to have to happen. This is now we're getting to like the bird's eye view of Fatima. She's upholding Christ's kingship. The king, by nature of being king, establishes right order under those whom he governs in his society. Right? That's what Christ the king does. He gives us right order in our family relations, in our spousal relationships, in our relationships within society, public and private, at the level of state. Everything is supposed to be rightly ordered as God decrees. Sin, of course, undoes that. 
And the devil wants to undo all of God's right order, bringing in really a diabolical revolution. Okay, so that's what the devil's up to. Now, what's missing from Pius XI's document here, and I think it's because he just never thought he had to put it in. He, he couldn't have foreseen these times, but it's obviously true. I would go back and when I read to you saying, nor is there any difference in this matter between the individual and the family or the state or the church for all men, whether collectively or individually, are under the dominion of Christ. He, he never bothered to mention the church. I think it's because he took it as a given that Christ was supposed to govern in his church. But they have uncrowned him, and he is no longer governing in his church. Those with authority have cast him out. So we need to bring that back, just like when Pius the end says, nor is there any, um, you know, when we say that when once men recognize both in private and in public life, I would add, and in ecclesial life, that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessings. And again, that's what the message of Fatima is about, bringing Christ the king back into all of those levels. So I would say, and I would propose to you, that we could say Christ's kingship, his universal and social kingship, has three parts. It's like a three-part structure. First, king over the individual. Our mind, our heart, our will, our body. All organized according to the principles of Catholic virtue. And then, king over nations. The public sector. Society must be recognized, society must be organized according to Catholic principles. And the popes have taught this as well. And then he also has to be king over the church. The church has to be organized under proper, true Catholic dogma. As some of the priests have said already, lex orandi, lex credendi, the right rule of worship and the right rule of faith. So three levels, Christ is king over the individual, over nations, and over the church. The diabolical revolution goes against all of that. And I've talked about this in other talks, so I'd encourage you maybe to catch them on the Fatima Center's channel, especially in the talks we were giving in June. Uh, but very simply, in some ways you could say a three-part intensification of the diabolical revolution. It's more, because it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. But we could say in 1517, when Martin Luther posts his 95 Thesis and starts Protestantism, he really starts the growth of individualism. That's what Protestantism was. So again, that's the disorder in the individual. And then you had, uh, in 1717, the Freemasons get organized, and all their work leads to the French Revolution. So now we have them trying to upend altar and throne. They're trying to destroy Christ's throne and his altar in society, public society. So again, individual, 1517 then in society, 1717, and then in 1917, when you have the Bolshevik Revolution of the Communists, which is when Our Lady of Fatima comes, that really is saying God is not even our creator. We will be atheistic. So God isn't king of anything. His church doesn't exist. It's full-blown atheism, going against natural law, going against God the creator, going against God's church. And so we see him successively being dethroned from all his three spots. Well, what does the message of Fatima tell us? It's connected to Christ the King. I hadn't really seen this before until I started thinking about it through this lens. And I would say it's got three parts. The Great Secret, which was revealed on July 13, 1917. I would argue that the first part, which is the vision of hell, many souls falling into hell, primarily is dealing with that salvation of the individual. These individual souls, of which there are countless, that are falling into hell, and our Blessed Mother is trying to save us all. And then in the second part, she goes on to start talking about the consecration of Russia and the wars that are going to affect the world and how only she can help us from that. So that's really this sort of salvation on, on the worldwide scale for the nations, paralleling against Christ's kingship. And the third part, which is what we don't fully know yet, clearly is going to have to do with the salvation for what's going on within the church. You know, recalling John Bosco's dream where the bark of Peter is connected to the Holy Eucharist and to our Blessed Mother and her Immaculate Heart. Right? And that's how it got revealed. The reason there are three parts is because Our Lady had Sister Lucia reveal them at three different times. So it's really from Our Lady that we've got these three parts, individual, society and nations, and then the church. And that's why the third secret deals all about with the dogmas of the faith, which have to be preserved in Portugal. Right? It's all about What's going on in the church? Our true faith. It's talking about the apostasy that's going to take place in the church, in the highest levels of the church. Again, in the church. It most likely warns against an evil counsel. I'm pretty convinced the words evil counsel are in the third secret, part that we haven't heard. And here, just so everyone understands, evil in an Augustinian sense for certain, where evil means a good which is lacking and ought to be there. A good that ought to be there and is lacking. 
And if you analyze those documents of Vatican II and what took place there, definitely there were goods of an ecumenical council that were lacking. Um, talks about terrible chastisements. I'm sure this third part of the secret, natural chastisements, plague, famine, man-made chastisements, war, and other things. And it probably also talks about supernatural chastisements that we're going to have to suffer. All, again, because of this great sin that is being perpetrated against our Lord and Our Lady at the level of the individual, at the level of the society. And now we've sort of reached the apex and the climax and the worst part of the diabolical revolution within the church as well. Okay, so... So to get the problem, what's the solution? Well, she gave us the solution because she loves us. And the solution is devotion to her immaculate heart. That's really at the essence of Fatima. That's why in many ways, I think June 13th is the most important revelation or the most important apparition visit of our Blessed Mother because that's when for the first time in history, our Blessed Mother reveals her immaculate heart. She shows it to the children. And of course, it's outraged by men's sins. But if you really stop to think a little bit about this, the Immaculate Heart is what God loves the most. It is what He cherishes the most. It is His most perfect creation. It is what He delights in the most and is the most beautiful thing. If we could somehow have this balance where you could put everything God has created, okay, all the saints, all the angels, all of God's wondrous creation, and I was floored yesterday by when Father Mosley is talking about how the tree represents everything, right? With the dirt coming up and the fruit going on. And I'm thinking, boy, you see all God's plant in the tree. So you put all that beauty and everything's got, a lot of things have that. You put all that beauty God has made in each one of us. And on the other side, you put the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother far outweighs us all. And, and glory to God for that. Um, that's how much he delights in her. That's how much he cherishes her. And so now we're at this moment where our sin is so great that nothing can appease him anymore. Nothing can bring back divine justice and make up for what's happened except her immaculate heart. Only her immaculate heart is sort of going to captivate God enough and that he loves it so much it's going to be able to move his heart from the divine justice that we all so richly deserve, starting with myself. That's why she's there, and that's why God loves us so much. And also, she just blow your mind how much God loves us, that this which he treasures most, he's now, as Sister Lucia said, almost if we could speak in human terms, with a certain trepidation, with a certain fear, he's extending that most precious treasure he has to us, giving us one last chance at salvation. This is the last offer. There are no more after this. And if we reject his own mother, there are no other solutions. The only solution is devotion to her immaculate heart, and turning to Our Lady. This is why she says, only she can help you, referring to herself. It's not anything about her, but it's because that's how God wills it, and that's what God is allowing. And that's why Fatima is so urgent, and we really need to pay heed, because there are no other solutions except the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so I look at it again, and I think, well, in 1925 at Ponta Vedra, she appears and gives us the first Saturday devotion and asks us to practice that first Saturday devotion every month. And then she sweetens the deal because she loves us so much, and she says, look, if you do it for five Saturdays in a row, I promise that at the moment of your death, I will give you all the graces you need to be saved. So if you can do five Saturdays in a row, according to the devotion she's asked, she's going to be there at the moment of your death, and it doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. It doesn't matter how heinous your sins may be. She's going to give you the grace that you'll go to heaven. It's an amazing and beautiful promise because she wants us doing this first Saturday devotion to gain much reparation for many other sinners who have no one else to pray for them. But you see how very much I see the first Saturday devotion as something we can foster in our own parishes and sort of at the individual level. So that first part, devotion to the Immaculate Heart for Saturday for the individual. But that's not all Our Lady wants. She wants to save the world. She wants to save nations. She does not want the annihilation of nations, although that's a conditional prophecy and may happen if we don't obey. And so what does she say? In the second part of the message, she comes at Tui, which Father Rodriguez was talking about, right, on June 13th, 1929, and she says, now is the time for Russia to be consecrated. Because that way the greatest nation that promoted all these errors that has been the scourge of nations is going to be converted through this consecration this consecration is going to release a flood of graces by which Russia will be converted. And there'll be great miracles. 
And then many others will be converted. I firmly believe the Muslims will be converted. They've got to be converted too. And then we're going to have peace in the world. It's all going to be sort of the switch that lets it go is the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. This worldwide salvation, this peace of na- of, and, and salvation of nations, if you will. And again, Christ now being established in the individual through your first Saturday devotion. Christ now being established in the nations by this consecration of Russia. And then, obviously, the third part is all about the church. And what does she say? She says that the goal, God says, is that the Immaculate Heart of Mary, devotion to it, is supposed to be placed alongside devotion to the Sacred Heart, really throughout the world and throughout His church. That's for the church. And the only reason the church is going to recognize that is because it's going to see the others. It's going to see the great miracles wrought by Our Lady in this conversion of Russia. And that's what's going to elevate the devotion to the Immaculate Heart within the church. And then Our Lady's Immaculate Heart is going to reign in the individual and in nations starting with Russia and in the church. And as the Immaculate Heart of Mary reigns, well, her son is going to be reigning there also with her. And you're going to have the kingship of Christ being established in the world as it ought in a period of peace under the triumph and the reign of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So so that's really the bird's eye view. And that's why no one should be able to deceive you about Fatima. This is Our Lady's promise. Kind of get the whole picture so that you're not thinking, well, maybe Russia was consecrated in 84, or maybe Russia was consecrated back in March of 2022. If you get the picture and you know what's supposed to be happening, then, then you realize that this is all a deception of the devil who only wishes to ape God and spread his revolution further and distract us from the things that are true. Christ. Christ is truth. Christ is the king. I'll just quote it for you so you have it. Sister Lucia revealed to her confessor on May 18th, 1936, saying, Recently I asked our Lord why he would not convert Russia without the Pope making the consecration. Our Lord deigned to answer her, as Sister Lucia recorded in her letter, because I want my whole church to acknowledge that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that it may extend its cult later on and put the devotion to this Immaculate Heart beside the devotion to my Sacred Heart. Okay, so that's the end goal what God wants. God wants us devoted to his mother's Immaculate Heart and to his Sacred Heart. That's what he wants. And so he's not going to give the world peace and he's not going to let Russia get converted and he's not going to end all the chastisements until Russia is properly consecrated. And then it's got to be a quick consequential action because as human beings we're temporal we see cause and effect if Russia is consecrated and nothing happens and 10 years later you get world peace well then no one's going to make the link to the Immaculate Heart's consecration and then no one's going to want to extend devotion to the Immaculate Heart all around the world right can't happen that way it has to be very quick we're all going to have to see it we're all going to have to there's going to have to be a general acknowledgement by the world's population that this good came about because that Pope got together with the bishops and consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart. And then all these things started happening. It has to be that way. Otherwise, we won't have this devotion to the Immaculate Heart. We are so hardened in our hearts and hardened in our sin. So don't let anyone deceive you about the importance of Fatima, and you yourself will know when it takes place. I like to tell people this. I say, if you had been there at the Cova de Iria in 1917 on October 13th, and had witnessed the miracle of the sun about to fall on top of you, about to burn up the earth, and then suddenly go back after it had been emitting all these crazy colors and all those things, you would not have needed anyone to tell you a miracle took place. <laughs> you wouldn't have needed, it doesn't matter if a pope or a theologian or a bishop or a Freemason or a newspaper said a miracle took place or a miracle didn't take place. It wouldn't have mattered to you. You would have known a miracle took place because God is at work. And when God is at work, his word is not in vain, right? We have to have faith. And often we lack so much faith. The miracle he's going to do when we obey far outweighs the miracle of the sun. Far outweighs. In ways you and I cannot possibly even imagine. But we just don't seem to have that faith and we think so little of God. That his power is so impotent. Maybe it's because we're impotent. But, but God is not that way. So we have to have more faith. And you have to realize when it happens, you will know it happened. Certainly someone who's at a Fatima conference and has even just a little bit of faith in Our Lady of Fatima is going to know. I mean, we got to get to the point where the atheists and the Freemasons and the ones who believe in evolution and the the Big Bang and all the crazy things and the general even their eyes have got to be opened. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here with Fatima and why it is so important. And God's done this before. I mean, the Aztecs were stuck in Satanism. 
ripping out hearts while people were still alive, throwing the bodies down, and then cannibalizing the bodies. That's the Aztec culture. Diabolical. Our Lady of Guadalupe crushed that serpent's head. Lepanto, similarly, prayed the rosary, and never again, the Muslims had controlled the Mediterranean Sea. It had been known as the, the, I think, the Muslim Sea or the Sea of Islam or something like that for many centuries, the Mediterranean Sea, and they had the strongest navy, and it got crushed. And really, the Muslims have never raised another navy since 1571. That's a pretty total victory that Our Lady brings about with the rosary. Why is this the solution, the Immaculate Heart? You might ask that. Because we are at the end of an age, as I said earlier, this age is coming to an end. We're going to get to a new age, and I believe after that new age of peace comes Antichrist and the world's over. What the lines are, how long, well, I'm not a prophet, so I'm not going to tell you that. We do have some mystics who have spoken on that, though. You can look into it. But because we're at this end of this age that is so diabolical and the revolution has gotten so serious, as I said, God has saved his most precious, most powerful gift for now. In an interview, uh, it's a very important interview. I encourage you to read it. December 26, 1957, Sister Lucia spoke with Bishop Fuentes, Alfonso Fuentes, who was then pursuing the cause of canonization for Jacinta and Francisco. And it's the last time Lucia got to speak publicly. After this, she was silenced a few years after that. This is 1957 at the end. Uh, I believe she knew she was going to be silenced. I think our Lord and Our Lady let her know. And so in this interview, she was revealing as much as she could about the third secret without violating the trust that she had to keep. So read that secret again and again and again. The Fatima Center certainly has it on its website. You can find it. But that final interview, again, December 26, 1957, it's a very important interview. So I'm just going to quote a little piece of that. All of it is so good, and you see it. It's like she's telling us what's going to happen, and we're living through it right now. But she says, Our Lady said to my cousins as well as to myself that God is giving two last remedies to the world. These are the Holy Rosary and devotion to the Immaculate of Mary. These are the last two remedies, which signify that there will be no others. These are the last two remedies. There are no others. Even if they take the Mass away from us, even if the Mass goes underground, which is a possibility, and I speak here of the authentic, traditional Latin Mass, the Mass of all ages, might go underground. It's a possibility. It's been prophesied. Maybe now, maybe later, maybe when Antichrist comes, it's going to happen. But we never lose our rosary. They might put you in a concentration camp. They might put you in prison. But you follow Father Molly's advice and go out there and get yourself thrown in prison for three months or in a monastery without a priest, you still have the rosary. You've got to meditate on that rosary, which encompasses the entire gospel. All the sacred scriptures really are in the rosary. And devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. They cannot take that away from us. But those are the last two remedies. No others will be offered. In the plans of divine providence, God always, before he is about to chastise the world, I'm sorry, quoting Lucia again, before he is about to chastise the world, he exhausts all other remedies. Now, when he sees that the world pays no attention whatsoever, then as we say in our imperfect manner of speaking, he offers us with certain fear the last means of salvation, his most holy mother. It is with certain fear, because if you despise and repulse this ultimate means, we will have no more forgiveness from heaven. Okay, so um, we're going to get into some interesting stuff that everybody likes to hear about. Uh, if, if they tell you Antichrist... In the New Testament, you should immediately say, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. That's where the Thessalonians seemed that maybe they thought they were at the end of the world. And St. Paul says, okay, okay, let me straighten you out again. I've already given you this teaching, but I'll give it to you again. And there's one line that is very cryptic, and I only wish St. Paul had been more clear. He probably taught the Thessalonians about it. We are left to somewhat speculate. So very quickly, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 10, St. Paul is saying, Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first, and we're living in that revolt, the man of sin to be revealed, that's Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he will sit in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Okay, so this is the time of Antichrist. He wants to be worshipped like God in the temple. Temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. He's going to try to enthrone himself there. That's what the church fathers tell us. Paul goes on, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, it's the mystery of sin, the mystery of why God's allowing the devil to do what he does, for the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only 
that he who now doth holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way. And then the wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus shall kill with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, so the devil wants to bring an antichrist. And he's always trying to bring an antichrist, this mystery of iniquity. But there is something that holds that back and doesn't let antichrist come. And so until that's removed, once it's removed, then antichrist comes in. Okay, that's what Paul is teaching. He says, so you know what's holding him back because I taught you that. So now all Christians say, well, what is it that holds him back? Because that's the mysterious part. Um, and so the church fathers have said different things. I actually believe that, you know, there's no mutually exclusive answer. It's with the scriptures. You often have a lot of answers that are, that are true, maybe all kind of working together. So some of the things that church fathers have told us is that it's the Catholic faith. Here we could say it's the dogmas of the faith. It's truth. Well, that makes sense. Jesus Christ is truth. But as the dogmas of the faith fall, it gets weaker and weaker, Antichrist is pushing in more and more. We certainly see that going on with Fatima. Others have said that it is the church herself. But if the church is going down or an anti-church is being put, we see the problem there. Others have said it's the Holy Mass, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, which makes sense because it's Christ's sacrifice. But the Holy Mass is under great attack and being shoved down. Others have said it's the Pope. Well, the Pope is Christ's vicar, so that makes sense. And as you move the Pope out of the way, or you get a fake Pope, or you get a Pope who's not acting like the Pope, it makes it much easier for Antichrist to come in. And others have said it's the Holy Roman Empire, the union of church and state, that whole problem of the kingship of Christ. And the Holy Roman Empire also gets moved out of the way. What we see is we're now living in a time where each one of these is either gone or greatly being attacked and almost gone. Okay? That's why we're at this point in the revolution. That's why it's so bad and the offenses are so wrong against God. And that is why, at this point, only the Immaculate Heart can save us. So the Immaculate Heart is also going to hold that back and can push it all back and can bring all those things back and restore them. The bulwarks are falling apart. God knows the bulwarks are falling apart. The diabolical revolution is incredibly intensifying. We're on the verge of World War III, nuclear war, destruction, certainly the loss of many souls, and therefore we get the last remedy, Our Lady, she who crushes the serpent, her immaculate heart and her rosary. Okay, only she can help us again because only she can offer the reparation that we need now. And she wants us to unite with our rosary and with our first Saturday devotion and with this consecration of Russia to unite our reparation to her reparation, which she then offers to God. There's a wonderful little book. I think they might have gotten it from St. Louis de Mont for another saint. It's, I think, called Take It to the Queen. It's a kid's book. I like reading it to my children. Uh, but in that story, you know, it's, it's really a story of man. But there's this one point where the town basically is, is lost it. They have nothing left to give. And so they bring this, you know, awful little looking apple I'm pretty sure St. Louis de Montfort talks about this too. And, and they give it to the queen. And then the queen takes it and cuts out some of the moldy part. And she puts it on this beautiful plate that she knows the king loves. And she dresses in her most beautiful royal you know, finery. And then she goes before the king and offers this to him. And of course, the king is ravished by her beauty and he loves it. And it doesn't matter really where this apple came from. Uh, he still wants it and he's so grateful for his queen. You know, in many ways, that's kind of what it's doing. That little apple is like what we can put together. Uh, our reparation. Now the queen still needs something. She wants something from us. And once we hand that over to her, then the Immaculate Heart of Mary takes over and goes and presents it to the king and affects all these many graces. Okay? But again, only she can help us and we have to be obeying her and doing what she has asked. So, to get this world peace, we're going to need Christ's law, his right order. Christ has got to be king, and Mary's got to reign. So, we're going to need that unity within the individual. Christ has to reign in your mind, your heart, your soul, and your body. And that basically means you have to live the message of Fatima. Okay, so that's really what you can control. And everyone always asks me, well, what can I do? Well, this is what you can do. Okay, so I'm going to try to give it to you in a simple way that I like. And I hope you remember it. You never forget it. I think mnemonic devices help, and I think it's very applicable here. So, it's Roman Catholic... SOS. You are all Roman Catholics, and we have to send this plea to God. Okay, I think it's a good image because SOS we often associate with boats, seafaring, and when we're on the bark of Peter that's taking on water and looks like it's going to sink, and we got to 
chain ourselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Holy Eucharist, St. John Bosco's dream. Even in the Gospel, you have those passages where the water's coming into Peter's bark and the apostles will say, Lord, save us for we perish. Right? Or you even have St. Peter trying to walk on water because he's thinking with faith. And then when Peter, the Pope, starts thinking in worldly ways, he begins to sink and our Lord has to lift him up. So there's this SOS that's got to go up, a heavenly cry. You've got to be Roman Catholic, though, for it to work. Okay? You have to be a Roman Catholic. And what that really means when I say Roman Catholic, I'm not just talking about being Catholic in name. I'm talking about really trying to be what Christ's disciples are meant to be. So the baseline for that, cease offending God and obey his laws. Right? And Our Lady Fatima says that again and again and again. You must cease offending God. You must obey his laws. Put another way, the positive way, stay in a state of grace. So that's baseline, because if you're not in a state of grace, you can't be gaining any merit. You, you have no good works. You have no good works. You have no merit. So cease offending God and stay in a state of grace because you're Roman Catholic. Okay? And then you can offer up this plea because you're on this bark that's sinking. That's kind of the image. And then the Roman Catholic SOS gives you the five things. So R for Roman is the rosary. You pray the rosary every day. You pray with more devotion. You pray it more meditatively. Slow down as you pray it. Pray the rosary better. It will solve all problems, Our Lady has promised. There is no problem so great that the rosary can't solve. God has given it a greater efficacy in these times. I personally believe Sister Lucia says that, and Our Lady told her that, because I think we're going to lose the Mass at some point. There are a lot of people that in many ways have already lost the Mass. but They haven't lost the rosary, so God in His goodness, Our Lady is Mother of Mercy, and Mother of Grace is giving us that greater efficacy to that rosary. That's your R, the C for Roman Catholic. Consecration. You've got to consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So follow St. Louis de Montfort's method. Get yourself consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. And then, of course, pray for the consecration of Russia because it's the individual and the state. And as you pray for that, you're also going to be praying that she be enthroned in the church the way she's supposed to, this devotion to the sacred and immaculate hearts. But consecration, very important, your own self, because you can control that, but pray that the Pope, in union with all the bishops, consecrates Russia the way he's supposed to, Russia alone, in a public ceremony, on a day of worldwide reparation. Okay, that's what our ladies ask. That's never been done. The reparation's so important. It's integral to the message of Fatima. Then you got the S for Roman Catholic SOS. The S is the scapular, wear your brown scapular. So again, if you're not wearing it, get invested in it and wear it always. Wear it faithfully. The scapula also has its conditions. You're supposed to live chastity according to your state in life, and you're supposed to pray the rosary every day. Okay, So make sure you're wearing that scapula faithfully. Uh, then you have the O, which is offer prayer and penance. Offer your prayers and penances well, in atonement for your own sins, for the conversion of sinners, for the souls falling into hell that, no one, that there's no one to pray for, for the Pope and the bishops, for our hierarchy, for our priests. It's a lot of prayer and penance we can offer. And then the last S is the Saturday, the first Saturday. Do the first Saturday devotion. You just got the five components. Every first Saturday, you receive Holy Communion. You go to confession. That's within eight days before or after. You pray the rosary, and you do a 15-minute meditation on the mysteries of the rosary. One or all, or a combination of the rosaries. Meditate on the rosary, life and virtues of our Lord and Our Lady. And you do all of those with the intention to offer reparation to Our Lady. And we have all that described back there in our different uh, pamphlets and things, so you can always get more information on that. But that's what you've got to do. So the Roman Catholic, SOS, those five things. Um, second is we're going to need unity between the church and the state. Okay, that is something Our Lady is going to bring about. We've had that problem since the ancient world, emperors and kings, Protestantism. The Lateran Treaty, when the Pope said, I no longer have any temporal authority, and he gave it all up, it's right after the Lateran Treaty gets signed within a week, that was June 7th, 1929. So on June 13th, 1929, Our Lady says, now is the time. Because the Pope had just said, I have no temporal authority. I give it all up. But he has all temporal authority because he's Christ's vicar. You can't be Christ's vicar and not have any temporal authority because then you're saying Christ doesn't have temporal authority. This was the problem of Pius XI with the Lateran Treaty and why I believe Our Lady came and said now because church and state were being further split. So now we're going to consecrate Russia, the atheistic nation that has spread all these errors, you can only consecrate what you have authority over. When the Pope consecrates Russia, he's saying, I have authority over it. Christ has authority over it. It's living out Christ's kingship. And pray that we'll have a holy Roman emperor, again, who's really holy, and a good, saintly Pope who are working together for this great restoration. Those are in the prophecies also. Pray for unity in the church. See, so you have to have East and West united. 
You're not going to have world peace if the church is not united. We've got these deep schisms that go back a long way between the East and the West, but the main representative of the division in the East is Russia. That's actually Russia's oldest error. Schism and rejection of the papacy goes back from the beginning, okay? And when the East would come back, like Constantinople would come back and come back, and then they'd leave and they'd come back, they've always had that history. They've always acknowledged the Rome to have primacy over them. But the Russian Orthodox said no at the Council of Florence in 1440. When the Byzantine Constantinople said yes, the Pope has authority over us. Russia said no. It's remained her oldest error, schism. Right now, I think Russian Orthodoxy represents about 80 to 85 percent of the Orthodox. So when the Russian Orthodox come back into the fold under the Pope and are united with the one holy Roman Catholic Apostolic Church, and I believe also the Muslims are coming in, you're going to have this great unity in the church again. East and West are united. Our Lady of Fatima is going to bring that about. She has to, because how can you have world peace otherwise? You can't have world peace otherwise. I just don't see it. So that schism in the church will be healed by Our Lady of Fatima. And Russia certainly has a big role to play in this. I'm not sure how it's all going to work. It is a little mysterious. But those are the things that are coming. And that's why the Pope has to command the bishops. He's got to get them all together obeying him because that asserts Christ's authority over his church. It really is not going to be enough just to say, oh, if you'd like to do it, join me. Inviting them. You've got to command them because Our Lady has commanded this and Christ has commanded this. And our Lord even told Lucia that. The the Pope's going to have to command the bishops. Otherwise, they won't do it. And if they don't do it, I guess they're not bishops anymore. You probably should put that in there also. Then you get all the bishops doing it, and then all the church acknowledges the Pope's authority, which means they acknowledge Christ's authority in his own church. And we crown him again as he's supposed to be crowned, since we've also uncrowned him, certainly in the aftermath of Vatican II. And when all this happens, there's going to be, again, great miracles. It will be obvious to you. But we need a lot of reparation. Okay, so this isn't going to happen without reparation and without suffering. So expect the great miracles. Have a lot of faith. Uh, that's our faith. I mean, just imagine our Blessed Mother. She consecrates herself as a virgin to God, and then the angel appears and says, you're going to have a son. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But she has faith, and it happens. And Christ dies, and she's holding her dead son. But she believes in the resurrection as faith. Com- goes against everything any man could think. That's what God calls us to in faith. Think of Abraham. Right? Father was telling us, love Abraham. Same thing, the faith of Abraham. He believes in that which men would say is impossible. That's the faith God wants us to have. Believe that the virgin can give birth to the child. The child of God. The son of God. Believe that the son of God can die and raise again. Right? For Abraham, believe that out of you I will bring forth life. It's a faith in the impossible. Because for men it is impossible. We have no hope anymore. We can't solve it. But Our Lady can solve it. She's the model. She had this faith. We have to have that faith. Don't cut God short. Expect the impossible from Him. Pray to Him and say, God, I want you to do the impossible. Because only you can do this thing that is not humanly possible anymore. The world is in such a mess. It's the Immaculate Heart that's going to bring it all about. We just have to have faith. We just have to remain devoted. Keep that bird's eye picture. Understand the great unity that comes within church and state all together, that comes within the church, all under the Pope, that comes into each individual heart as we all devote ourselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary with great faith. That is the promise of Fatima. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. And so many of these fights, like Jael knocking the tent peg through Sisera's head, or the woman of Thebes throwing the millstone on his head, this doesn't mean we're supposed to be out there with hammers and tent pegs and and swords. But it is that brutal, the fight is that brutal in the spiritual realm. We're supposed to be this um, uncompromising with sin, the devil trying to get a part in our soul. So of these series, we'll see why the figures against the female figure are genuine figures of the Antichrist in their ambition.